Hello, this is CS11, lecture number 11, where we talk about random numbers and simulations. Before we get started, I should mention that the random number technique that I'm going to demonstrate today and that you're going to see in the textbook only generates pseudo-random numbers. What that means is these numbers are good enough for simple purposes, like params you'd write in CS11, or for use in games, but not good enough for use in encryption or any actual scientific use. All right, to generate random numbers, we're going to use the rand command. And in order to use the random uh, command, you'll need to include the C standard library header. And let's print out that value. OK, compile and run the program. and run the program, and we get 16,807. And notice that if we run the program several times, we get the same number. Uh, why is that? Well, the random number generator uses a sequence of values, and each time you run the program, you get the same sequence. In order to get a different sequence each time we run, we have to do what's called seeding the random number generator, which is to provide it a number that it can use to initialize itself with. Well, what source of numbers can we use? Can't use the random number generator because you'd still get the fixed sequence. And a very common technique is to use the current time. So we'll add an additional pound include, pound include, C time. And then we can do the srand command, which stands for seeding the random number generator. So that prepares it to give you a different sequence each time and use the current time. Note that seeding the random number generator is something that you do only once, exactly once per program, and that would typically be one of the very first things you do in main. All right, I'll save that and recompile the program and run it. And notice this time I'm getting different sequences. Now, the time command I'm using here has second accuracy. So if I run the program quickly twice in the same second, I'll get the same value. But otherwise, I will get different values. Now, these random numbers that I'm generating might not be particularly useful. For example, what if you wanted to simulate a die roll, you know, a number between 1 and 6? We can do that with some arithmetic. To generate a random number between 1 and 6, you can take the random number that we get and use modulus. And remember, when we divide by 6, we'll get the remainder. That will give us a value between 0 and 5. And then we can add 1, and that will give us a value between 1 and 6. In the textbook, they show you the arithmetic to get a numeric value in any range. All right, so add that in there. And I'll recompile the program and run, and 2, 3, four, five, six. Oh, funny. Now, it's a random sequence, so sometimes things like that will show up. Okay, so that's a little bit about the random number generator. Now, a little bit later in chapter, there's a really nice section that talks about doing simulations with random numbers. And one of my very favorite programs in the textbook uses random numbers to estimate a value for pi. The program is called Monte Carlo.cpp in chapter 4. And here uh, I have a slightly modified version of it. I took the original program and made a few changes, improvements. And let's talk first about the method in case the arithmetic in the textbook wasn't clear how this method is going to work. All right, so let's imagine that we've got a square with size 2 by 2. And in the center, 
Here, we'll put a circle with a radius of 1. Okay, so there's a circle with a radius of 1. And if we randomly generate a value for x and y coordinates in the range of negative 1 to 1, and pretend that it's a dart that we're throwing at this board, the ratio of the times that we hit inside of the circle and outside the circle will give us a nice approximate value of pi. Pi is equal to 4 times the number of hits over the number of tries, where hits is how many times it's been in the circle, and tries is how many times you've generated a random number in total. Let me show you how that math works out. First of all, we have to remember the formula for the area of a circle is pi r squared. And so for a circle of radius 1, 1 squared is 1, and so the area of this circle is pi. The area of the square is 2 times 2, or 4. So the number of hits over the number of tries is going to be equal to this ratio. That's because every dart that we throw is going to land somewhere on the square, but only pi out of four of them are going to also land inside of the circle. And now, with this equation, we can just multiply both sides by four, and you get pi equals four times hits over tries. So, we just run the simulation, and as we increase the number of throws, our estimate should approach a good value for pi. All right, let's take a look at the program, which I've modified slightly. One in the textbook has a constant called tries, and I've changed it to be the input of a variable. And I like this because we're going to be able to run the program and increase the number of tries, and as we do that, it's going to be much easier to see how our estimate approaches a good value for pi. Also, the um, original program had an extra variable r, which I've taken out. We don't like to have more variables than necessary. And the original program had uh, four lines of calculations. I've simplified it down to, to two. Okay, so let's go ahead and compile and run that program. And we'll run the program, and we'll give it one try. Notice our estimate for pi is 4. Let's run it again, and 10 times, and our estimate is 3.2. And run it again, 100, 3.04, and so on. Let's run it a few more times, increasing the number of as we go. And notice that as we increase the number of guesses, our estimate gets better and better. Okay, well that wraps up our quick look at random numbers. Thank you.